Welcome to In Place, the Ecologies of Sound in the Southwest with artists Jennifer Nev Diaz and Dylan McLaughlin in conversation with Dr. Stephen Feld. This is the third of a series of laser talks titled In Place, Recentering Ecocritical Knowledge of the Natural World. The first two lasers you can see on this slide were in place representing environmental racism and remediation on tribal lands and communities of color and in place the aesthetics of placemaking through land-based practices. SciArt Santa Fe is a nonprofit dedicated to the integration of art and science in public programming and education. SciArt Santa Fe hosts four to six lasers, laser talks each year in coordination with Leonardo, the International Society for the Arts, Sciences and Technology. Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous or lasers are informal presentations by artists and scientists whose work takes a cross-disciplinary approach. So for more information, you can either visit the Sirat Santa Fe website or leonardo.info. This series is made possible with the generous support of the New Mexico Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the New Mexico Humanities Council. So I would like to introduce first Steve Feld, who is moderating this, uh, this presentation tonight. Uh, Steve is an anthropologist, filmmaker, musician, and sound artist. He's a senior scholar at the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe and distinguished professor of anthropology emeritus at the University of New Mexico. He's the recipient of a John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in 91. He was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 94. And in 2003, Steve received a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. Feld's academic research principally concerns the anthropology of sound, a term he coined in 1972 to extend the anthropology of music and language into a more critical sensory and aesthetic focus on voices and poetics, all species, sound relations, media and technologies and environmental and ecological acoustics. Feld's work ranges around the world from the anthropology of sound studies in the Basavi rainforest region of Papua New Guinea, where he researched the relations of environmental ambient sounds, bird calls, weeping, poetics and song to a research project on the global anthropology of world music, researching equity, representation, ethics, and power disparities between indigenous musicians and in the world of uh, rock stars in the mu music industry. And on to studies of urban diasporic acoustomology and jazz history in Accra, Ghana, fo focusing on Ganaba, the man who introduced the African talking drum to African American jazz drummers in the 1950s. Based on the Bosavi research, Feld expanded the framework of the anthropology of sound in the early 90s to acoustomology, a term coined at the conjunction of acoustics and epistemology to refer to sound as a way of knowing. I'm gonna go on and introduce Dylan and Jen too, and then uh, Steve will take the helm. So Dylan McLaughlin is a sound and video artist, storyteller and educator. Current living, currently living and working in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Looking to sites of extraction, his work explores forms of witness and implication. In his multimedia installation, interactive and performative works, McLaughlin looks to engage the poetics and politics of landscape formation and human effect. McLaughlin has, has exhibited solo and collaborative works across the country, including at the, <clears throat> at the Denver Art Museum and Smack Mellon in Brooklyn, New York. M McLaughlin is born of the Dine people. He received his BFA in New Media Art at, from the Institute of American Indian Arts and his Master of Fine Arts in Art and Ecology at University of New Mexico. Jennifer Nev Diaz is a new media artist based out of Albuquerque, focused on creating immersive, interactive environments. She was born in Los Angeles and lived in South Central well into her teens before spending a few years in rural New Mexico. By blending various mediums such as photography, programming languages, video, sound, and more, she invites the viewer to create unique experiences. Her work focuses on themes of memory, trauma, nature, curated spaces, 
and self-awareness within the art of interaction. She is heavily influenced by surveillance art feminism in the intersection of art and technology. Nev Diaz currently holds a Bachelor's of Fine Arts from the University of New Mexico. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. And it's uh, really a great pleasure to get to uh, help introduce and expand the reach of uh, the audience for Jennifer and Dylan's work uh, and to look into some of the resonances with this theme of ecology and sound in the Southwest. And uh, Dylan indicated that he would uh, kick things off for us. And what we're going to do is have Dylan make a presentation and then Jen is going to follow with one. And that way each of them will get a chance to tell us something about what they're working on, what some of their influences are, what some of their questions and issues are uh, that they're addressing and thinking about through and with their work. And then we'll take the conversation from there. So uh, again, thank you all for joining us and uh, over to you, Dylan. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, and thanks, um, Amy and the translators that are doing work behind the scenes here um, for some of us. Um, it's such an honor to be part of this really interesting and extensive community, um, mostly coming out of San the Santa Fe area. Um, so just, yeah, just wanna express my gratitude for, for being able to be here. Um, let me see, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna kick things off with um, sharing my screen. So, um, okay, so let me see. I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time kind of contextualizing some of the work that, it, that, that I do as an artist and, and have done over the years um, before we sort of kick, kick up things off into conversation. Uh, this is just a little bit of contact um, information for y'all to take a screenshot of or how, how whatever makes sense for you. Um, I know folks like to um, sometimes like multitask while on Zoom. Um, so I want to start with, um, I kind of, I kind of just chose, I was like, well, there's many starting points for, you know, wh where, to be, where to begin the story of creative process. And I want to start a few years back in uh, some of the work that I had started doing uh, with an art collective um, that I had formed with a couple other artists, um, also in the Santa Fe area, but kind of uh, throughout the continent, um, multi, like interdisciplinary multimedia artists. Um, I was working primarily as a, my background is, is prim, has been primarily working as a video artist and filmmaker. Um, and just a little bit of context of that, uh, after I finished studying uh, video at IAI in Santa Fe. Uh, I worked primarily as a as a sort of short form documentary filmmaker, uh, working mostly with art museums for a few years. Um, and I, I like to sort of start there, I think, because it was my real kind of like immersion into understanding what video was for me, what sort of like the beginning of the conversation of, of like, what is this technology um, that is so expansive and so connective. Uh, and also isolating and, you know, it's, co it's complex, it's a very complex space. I found that what I was really intrigued by within those technological spheres was the ability to tell personal stories, um, to study sort of like the relationships between things, uh, to study relationships and dynamics within uh, creative process and creative practice. So I, I interviewed a lot of artists over the, over the number of years. And I learned a lot about what it means to be a maker of things, what it means to uh, work with materials, uh, to question and confront, uh, you know, the politics of materiality. Um, I worked a lot with musicians over this time. It was all very formative in uh, my understanding of of just kind of what it meant to be someone who who thought critically and and made things. Um, that might sound like a really, you know, a, a 
a very simple, you know, simple concept. But for me, it was like, it's, it was all part of the process for me. I, I wasn't really raised with a really strong sense of what it meant to be an artist or to study art. Um, and so fast forward a little bit, I uh, started this art collective with um, uh, artist Chupa, Hans Galuger, Ginger Dunnell, and, and a few others. Uh, and we, um, we titled it Winter Count. And um, this first piece here is one of the big, one of the sort, sort of early pieces that we had created with this kind of simple concept of um, what if we followed lines and land uh, to then translate into a musical score. And it was a, a kind of a, referencing a few different things. One, um, uh, Chinupa is from, partly from uh, North Dakota uh, and comes from some practices of um, uh, sort of like these, these concepts of singing song lines, like singing horizon lines, using horizon lines to, to compose story and song. Uh, and so in, in essence, it's like very practically like place-based uh, song making, uh, place-based technologies for music composition. Uh, and so we started exploring that, but using drone, uh, drone visual imagery. Um, and so we created these long videos of these kind of falling lines and landscape that would then be translated into uh, performances. Um, I'm going to have to I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit more. Um, we followed uh, river lines, pipelines, uh, train lines, road lines, telephone pole lines, etc. Um, this was all work that we had started doing uh, in North Dakota uh, in 2018. Um, this is during also just kind of around the time of the whole Standing Rock water protector movement. Um, so this was happening sort of peripherally uh, and very connected to all of that. Um, this is a piece that we did in um, uh, Cuesta, uh, New Mexico, uh, as part of Taos Paseo. We were invited to, to create a piece um, there. All, all this, I should say, all of this work is available on my website as well. So if I know I'm going to go through this so fast, but just to kind of give a, give a bit of a context. Um, but all, all of this work kind of um, so, sort of set me on this path of, of these concepts of like continuing to explore technology, continuing to explore this idea of place-based making, place sort of responsive making. Uh, and through this, the work of this art collective, we really shifted our, our gaze towards um, the effect of ex extractive industries on indigenous communities, um, which, which are like literally everywhere. Um, and, and everything has been impacted by extractive industries. And so it just becomes, this, the stage is set with like, there's a lot of conversations to be had and there's a lot of stories to be told. Uh, and, and so here we were using technology um, to create sort of essentially prompts uh, or sometimes scores. Um, sometimes that remained very abstract. They're sort of prompts for conversations but sometimes there were prompts for dance performances or scores for music compositions, experimental um, improvisational music compositions, um, all, all the while sort of telling the stories uh, and portraying stories um, of, of, of how people are impacted by um, uh, uh, extractive corporations in different indigenous communities, in different places, small communities, small Northern New Mexico towns in this case. Um, after a few years of this work, I was really kind of propelled into this like sort of sphere, this creative sphere of thinking, okay, I'm so interested now in this idea of translating place using technology into sound. It was such a like fundamental sort of drive for me at the time. Um, and I, I took this photograph and I, I like this photograph because it kind of was like the beginning of me thinking like, oh, right, there's like, this looks like waveforms. This looks like sort of how we've come to uh, visualize sound. One, one of the forms in which we visualize sound. Um, and I, I got really excited about these ideas of translating uh, information from place into uh, other forms of in which we could ex experience, um, in this case, sonically. Uh, these are some bird lines, sort of like bird mi migratory lines that I started mapping while in our residence yet. Um, 
mass milka in, in the Western Massachusetts. Um, these are some cranes uh, flying overhead. Um, and I just was really interested in this idea of, of like, there's so much information that, that's taking place. There's so many stories that are being told constantly. And like, the, there's so much material to then kind of engage with in, in sort of this pursuit of, of um, understanding the complexities of how, for example, ecosystems are threatened by, by extraction, in this case with migrating um, cranes. Uh, short video. Um, let's see. So fast forward to, I, so I, I should mention, I just completed the art and ecology MFA program at the University of New Mexico. That's a whole long conversation that will probably come up throughout this talk. Um, but as I started there, uh, I was really obsessed with this, again, this idea of sort of sites of extraction. So I look, started looking very heavily at uh, some of the copper mines um, in southern New Mexico. This is the Chino copper mine in, in Silver City. And uh, it kind of, it led me down this very long rabbit hole that I'm still kind of trying to deconstruct and, and also reconstruct um, of this story of um, the Fairchild Semiconductor Corporation. It, it's, a, it's a long story that the very short version of the story is th this, this corporation was really sort of the, like a, in a really big way, a prompt for the technological world as, as we know it, as far, you know, as far as like sort of the corporate technological world uh, uh, material <laughs> as we know it. Um, and, and in 1965, this corporation opened a, a semiconductor uh, manufacturing plant on the Navajo Nation, hired a thousand Navajo women to, um, to build these components that were going into uh, early nuclear missile guidance systems, the Apollo space program uh, guidance systems, et cetera. Um, it's a long story. It's totally fascinating and, and like kind of, it's like, of course, of course, all this happened. Of course, it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know, layers and layers of like totally bewildering complexity. Um, here's a photograph from, from the time. This is from a brochure that they, that corporation Fairchild put out uh, in 1965 to sort of like um, promote this relationship that they're building with the Navajo Nation. Um, uh, yeah, as they, as they were, um, yeah, opening like op the the at the time their sort of main manufacturing um, plant that set me off on this whole fascination with uh, with like circuit building. This was totally brand new to me, but I think what it what it what it really sort of overall meant to me was that I, I realized that my work, technologically speaking, is very informed by the research that I'm doing, uh, and so I, I don't have like an inherent fascination with with technology necessarily I'm not I'm not I've never really been curious about building circuits but I started to because I was like well these all these Navajo women built these circuits like I feel like I sh I should I should try I should do that too it just kind of makes sense to as a way to kind of immerse myself in these stories um and so I uh I started building these circuits. I still started building these sort of like textile wearable uh, instruments that I intended to perform with. They're built out of copper. It all sort of, sort of was referencing the research that I was doing. I was using modular synthesis. Um, the technology is, is very synonymous with the technology that was coming out of uh, sort of the Silicon Valley, um, Bay Area, San Francisco in the, in the 60s. Um, it, it's a very intertwined story with this corporation Fairchild, um, but it really reinforced me exploring synth synthesis, which just kind of like, it's like, that's a, that's a sound, that's a sound art uh, platform. Like I had never considered myself really a sound artist, but all of a sudden I was making sound art performance pieces based on all this research that I was doing. Um, this is, I'll just play like a, a second of this a few seconds of this. Um, this is a performance I did uh, using the circuitry, the instrument that I built. 
I don't. Can you hear it? I'm not sure if you can hear it. You should be able to. Um, let me fix that really quick. Okay. Uh, oh no, what just happened? Uh oh. Sorry, I'm having a funny moment. Okay. <laughs> Oh All right. Um, then give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. quite abrasive probably especially on zoom but it's, it's kind of part, part partly the intention is um this idea of like i got really interested in uh, kind of the complex synthesis possibilities with the circuitry that i was building that was referencing all this um history uh and was curious again about again continuing these kind of like place-based performances um that face piece is is referencing this this is a transistor that was built in i think like 1967 or something uh this would, would in theory be one of the pieces the components that these women were manufacturing um i just kind of made it larger and cut it out of copper uh all right i'm gonna have to fly through the rest of this because i i feel like once i get going i just ramble for forever so i'm gonna try to finish up in the next couple of minutes um uh a little bit later um while still at, U, uh, at the University of New Mexico, I set up, embarked on this sort of a new art collective piece uh, with two other artists, Marissa DeMarco and Jessica Zeglin, who are also, uh, were also current students of, of UNM at the time. Um, this piece called There Must Be Other Names for the River. And essentially it's, uh, it's as you can read here, it's a, it's a score for six singers um, composed, comprised of, 50 years worth of historic stream flow data of the Rio Grande, um, with part of the score being projecting into the future of like sort of what the presence and absence uh, of the river may be. Um, the piece ends, the piece begins in 1974, uh, and it progresses one minute per year um, all the way until, um, until the present day. At, point, at which point it, the, the years start exponentially increasing, plus 10 years, plus 20 years, plus 30 years, all the way into the year 4,220, I think. Uh, and so it's a really interesting piece where we're asking the audience and the singers in this case to really embody and imagine 2000, the lifespan of the Rio Grande 2,000 years into the future, um, which is a, and that, the, the, that's a, there's a whole other story. There's a long conversation to be had there about that. Um, it's a really interesting sound piece. Here's a picture of the, the one of the versions of the, the visual score for that piece. Um, here's a piece from a performance. This is uh, Albuquerque-based musician Ryan Dennison. Um, Ryan is an absolutely incredible sound musician, sound artist, musician in, in the Albuquerque area. Um, these are uh, this is a performance that took place next to the river with our sort of core six singers for this project. At this point, we have many, many different artists involved in the project. It's been it's just it's continuing to grow and um, adapt, adapt and change. Um, oh, that is a video. Uh, there's the score again as a sort of a composite with all those layers pushed into one. So I really started exploring this idea of graphic notation uh, and for experimental composition. Um, <clears throat> this was the work that I finished uh, at finished with at UNM. Uh, again, it's kind of it's a kind of an evolution of that same idea of the circuitry and the copper 
um, uh, capacitive touch sensors and um, these place-based instruments. This is a piece called Songs of Tempest Tempestuous Rising and Falling uh, in reference to um, a Joy Harjo uh, poem. Uh, it was the show. The show I put together was primarily based around um, this idea of resonance coming from embedded in place. This is a, a uranium tailing storage site on the Navajo Nation. Uh, in this case, kind of literally thinking about this idea of resonance coming out of place. Uh, um, and this is a he it's a heavy, heavy, heavy idea in this case, thinking about radiation. Um, there's an elementary school like a quarter mile away from this uranium tailing storage site. Again, that's a whole other long com conversation. Uh, there's a series of graphics, hand-drawn graphic scores I did based around that research. Uh, this is a, another graphic score based on pinyon pine die-off. Um, I could talk about that for a long time too. Um, it's one of the things I researched. Maybe that'll come up a little bit later in the talk. Um, this is a still from a um, video performance I did from, from that series. And this is just a picture of some cranes flying uh, over maybe Albuquerque or something. Um, again, here's some contact information. Uh, screenshot that if you want to get in touch. I'll also put it in the chat. Um, sorry if that was a little haphazard. I tried to cover a lot of territory. Um, without going for too, too, too long. Um, but yeah, cool. Many Thank big you. stories, Dylan. Thank you. Um, and many themes that I know we're going to uh, want to come back to. Uh, Jen, could you screen share and take us into your work and world, please? Yes, of course. Um, I also want to thank everyone for putting this together and for allowing us to share this conversation with you. Um, let me make sure I shared sound. Um, sorry, my screen is also being wonky. Can you guys see my screen? Um, so I also want to give a little bit of context to my work. Um, I spent a lot of time researching the archaeology of trails, um, roads, and um, sorry. Um, let me just back up a little bit. I'm a little bit nervous. I haven't given a talk in a really long time because of the pandemic. Um, so my name is Jen. I'm a new media artist. I do... Um, work that um, basically uses, uses technology and I blend a lot of mediums together. Um, I started with photography and then I started doing film and then I eventually got to electronic art um, at UNM and that program is now called Exploratory Art and Technology. And I'm going to start in 2017. Um, I've been making work since 2012, but I think 2016 to on, I started really delving into the work that I really think defines who I am as an artist now. Um, so I researched the archaeology of trails and roads and places for a while, and I kind of came to this conclusion that everything around us is curated, and it's basically dictated by different agencies, and um, all our interactions with nature and the world around us is preset um, by parameters of either uh, government agencies, our communities, the world that we live in, the people we interact with. And so this kind of has um, sparked an interest for me to create work within programming languages. And um, programming languages kind of are what computer scientists use to tell computers how to build the environment and what parameters they can use. 
And so on the right, you can see I use Max MSP and it's a visual programming language. And this is the first piece where I really bridged all of my work together and it's called Trap Triggers. Um, I took a lot of photographs um, and they were like really dark photographs with really um, deep blocks. And I created an interactive installation. Um, and so this piece uses a webcam and um, digital photographs and the programming language to allow users to interact with it. And I really wanted to kind of create a visual experience um, where people were able to dictate um, what intrusions and um, were presented. Um, and with my work, um, sometimes the parameters aren't for everyone. Sometimes people don't understand how to interact with my work. And I learn a lot from people and I constantly develop my work um, so here in the art gallery, there's people who kind of know how to use it and then other people who don't know how to use it continue to work with it. Um, eventually I showed it again in Paseo. Um, so last year it was a pandemic. So we only were able to have a, a drive through And so I kind of wasn't able to show this piece in the interactive form and it was only the intrusions that were there. Um, and with the piece Trap Triggered, I really wanted um, people to be able to have autonomy over what they could see. Um, but here you couldn't, it's just there presented to you. Um, and it kind of, you kind of don't get a choice. You kind of just see what I have interacted with this piece as. Um, eventually I made um, Nonlinear and this piece is um, is also using the programming language. Um, and this recalls recorded videos of a place and cross fades it with live video. So as you interact with it, you kind of have an understanding that you get to dictate the visuals um, and you get to recall new visual. Um, and I really wanted to talk about how we are so used to like this world of being surveyed and we don't really have a lot of control in how we're viewed. Um, and we kind of have this illusion of control, um, but we're constantly being watched by the government, by our peers, by surveillance cameras. Um, everything that we have is kind of recorded. Um, so I kind of wanted to create an environment where you got to dictate what uh, previous recordings came up and what recording you wanted to store of yourself. Um, and then um, in 2017, I spent a lot of time in a wildlife refuge called Valle de Oro. And that is in the South Valley in um, Albuquerque. And it's a community, it's a lower income community. Um, and I spent a lot of time photographing this area and really learning about their process of kind of turning this place that was a dairy farm into a wildlife refuge. And so I really love this place because it's a beautiful example of how a community came together to fight environmental injustice. Um, so this place was gonna be sold and they were gonna build a factory here. And the community came together and basically um, raise money so they could instead turn it into a place for themselves to kind of be able to interact with the landscape around them. Um, and I thought that was really beautiful. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles and there's a lot of air pollution in LA. So it kind of spoke a lot to me um, being able to kind of shift what a place can be. Um, and here, what they're gonna do is they're gonna rewild the landscape with different timelines of habitat. And so that really piqued my curiosity and I photographed this place. I listened to it a lot, I recorded it a lot. And eventually I created this piece called Curated Soundscapes. And it's a, a soundscape that is randomized with this um, program. So I'll just play it for you guys. Um, and I wanted to kind of conceptualize or 
really listen to what would it be like if you integrated different sounds from different places, from different timelines, and allowing myself to be the person who dictates what those sounds are, and allowing the program to basically dictate which sounds it was going to how it was going to blend those together. Um, and with this piece, I like to call it in different places. So, um, call this a faster. Call it a faster. And so I really wanted to basically um, blend the different sounds to create new landscapes and really give the listener different iterations of place. Like, how will Valle de Oro sound? How does our landscape change all the time? And how do we dictate what it sounds like? Um, so that was what I was exploring there. Um, with my work, I also use, um, sorry, I use a lot of MIDI controllers, um, and MIDI controllers can be anything from like an Arduino to, um, kind of looks like a, a thing that DJs use, um, and I want to blend all of the different, like, videos that I have taken, so I have a huge catalog of videos of sound and, um, I like to kind of create new um, iterations of all of my different pieces. So um, with this one, I installed it, um, I projected it onto a parking structure and I allowed other people to come use the MIDI controller and have more agency and like knowledge that, oh, I'm the one dictating these visuals. Um, so that's kind of, how I got to my next piece, um, which is El Agave. And this piece I showed in Paseo in 2019. And so um, this one is also very near and dear to my heart. I created this with my peer. Her name is Brittany King. She is Danae. And I think both of us kind of have come from matriarchal families and kind of have this very connected um, connectedness to the land, to place, and to the world around us. Um, and we wanted to create a piece that um, spoke about that. So this piece uses um, sound from New Mexico. So even though we're a landlocked state, we have a lot of water. So I went and recorded with her and we took visuals, we took sound of all the different water in New Mexico. Um, and we wanted to make this piece interactive as well. So this is a basically a sculpture which we project, projection mapped. Um, and we chose the agave because it's a really resilient um, plant. Um, it thrives in the desert. And as women of color, we feel like we are really resilient as well. Um, and we wanted to create a piece that allowed people to interact with it and kind of dictate the visuals as well. So we used a Arduino to um, kind of gather all of the data to dictate the sound and then in turn dictate the visuals. Um, so it's very layered. Um, I'll let it play for a little bit. Um, this is our first iteration of it um, at Paseo. We had a little bit of trouble because of the amount of people that were there. And so the parameters that I had set were too small for the amount of people that were there. So we had to kind of um, a success but I I didn't want to show it here
the sound drowns me out. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so I'll just repeat what I said there. Um, so at Paseo, it wasn't a very, um, the parameters we had set um, for the sound was um, too small. So we weren't expecting as many people as, as showed up there. Um, and essentially the piece, um, it was a little bit jarring when you heard it. Um, so we kind of had to readjust a little bit um, and it was difficult to do that, but I think my work is very exploratory. And so um, I kind of have to just go with it. Um, like right now I was talking over the loud sound, um, but with all my work, I, I think that theme of curation and dictating visuals and dictating place is present. Um, this is supposed to say 2019. Um, and I kind of have this belief that we all, like all of our knowledge of place is dictated through the lens of someone else. Um, so all of the sounds that we hear around us and all of the artwork that we make is kind of dictated by other agencies. And so my work is in that same vein. And yeah, I like to explore that with people and I like people to bring their own lens to my work and help me evolve it and help me like continuously better it. Um, recently, I've been recording a lot of videos and kind of making a piece similar to curated soundscapes, but um, with visuals, it's kind of in its um, draft form right now. So um, I don't know if I'll show it today, but maybe I will. Um, so I'll just end there. Is that good? Sorry, kind of blew through that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. It's really great to get the, the kind of big picture and overview, although I know it's extremely difficult uh, for you and, and for Dylan to do that in 15, 20 minutes, you know, to just take us in simultaneously to the depth of thought and um, activity, as well as uh, the larger picture of how all of these things connect. Um, I'm not looking for the lowest common denominator here, but I'm struck by uh, a number of things that we could use as springboards. I know many people will have specific questions, but um, I'm struck by uh, a couple of things in, in the work that both of you are doing. And I was wondering if maybe we could strike up a little bit of a conversation around that. Um, both of you have done collaborative work both of you have been involved with collectives. You both have a very distinct and uh, you know, individuated kind of practice, but at the same time, you've both made clear to all of us uh, how much you know, your work involves uh, participation and, and, and collaboration um, with others and, and your interest in that and your respect for that. And uh, I think that's uh, a, a, a very interesting aspect of, of the way uh, both of you speak and both of you uh, present what you're doing. And I'd like to see if we could, you know, maybe get into that a little bit more, particularly around, um, you know, the way in which Dylan talked about relationships and telling stories. And, you know, Jen, you talked about everything being curated and your interest in you know, how your audience interacts with the work. And both of you use the words interaction you know, uh, quite a bit as well. So um, in terms of some, some of the key themes for me that um, uh, and, and maybe for some of those who um, might not you know, know where I'm coming from on this, I'm from a generation where, um, you know, most of us were not trained to do collaborative and collective work and to be that concerned with interaction. We certainly weren't uh, trained uh, to do work that was gritty and that was, you know, really exploring things that were 
you know, perhaps um, unpleasant to look at or unpleasant to hear. Um, in my generation, sound art meant really going for the purest, cleanest uh, kind of sound possible and, and making ecology uh, sound, um, you know, almost romantic, almost, you know, something like, you know, you just like a symphony orchestra that you want to have move into your house with you. And, um, you know, your generation has explored sound through the image and through the camera, has explored the image through the sound, has, you know, really taken up this kind of interactive challenge much more. And it also creates much more fertile ground for collaboration between the visual side of art and the sonic side of art and the movement side and, um, you know, particularly the use of video and the way in which uh, both of you make it really clear that you're doing this art as research and you're doing research and turning it into art. There's that kind of dynamic there. So that's a big mouthful, but um, that's just some of the wonderful stuff that impressed me uh, listening to both of you and exploring your websites. And I want to encourage everybody to explore uh, Jen and Dylan's websites and spend some time with these pieces because there's really a lot of rich um, work there and a lot of uh, uh, serious thought that's gone into these pieces. And uh, we just, you know, obviously can't get into the depth of all of that right now. But I was, I was wondering if you could each, you know, maybe say, just riff on this a little bit and, um, and also, you know, your experience of listening to each other today. Um, you know, what are the things that strike you as things that are really, you know, you know, both generational and things that come out of the kinds of awareness and kinds of worlds that you, you know, are concerned with the world as you, you're, you know, interacting with it and why this collaborative and collective and interactive kind of focus on research and art is, you know, so has obviously inspired you in lots of ways. Thanks, Steve. Um, that was really wonderful to listen to. <laughs> um, I, I, I can kick it off, cut me off at any point, Jen, or, or if I talk too much for, or for too long, but I, the, 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 the thing that comes to mind is kind of like the, the, through, the through line from, from a lot of the complexity and sort of like, I don't know, that multifaceted, multidimensional criticality you just sort of articulated, Steve, the sort of like drawing I don't know, relationships to lots of things, including sort of like this, I don't know, inter intergeneration, intergenerational experiencing of art, uh, sort of the, the fluctuations of the ways that we societally uh, utilize technology, the, the way we perceive technology. I mean, there was a lot there in, in the comments and questions you just framed. Um, but the thing that comes to the forefront for me as a real through line is this simple concept of protocol. Uh, and, and within protocol, I think for me, that's, that's some language that I've been cultivating that kind of extends into, um, it's, it's like, that, that's, that's a starting point. It's like, okay, we have this starting point. Like for, for a while, as I was working as a, as a video artist and filmmaker, I, I started thinking about how I I, I wanted to move away from extract, extractive term or extractive and or colonial terminologies rooted in language around around video art, uh, language like shooting, capturing, documenting. Uh, like these are colonial terms, um, and so I started looking, thinking about well, how how can we replace them with with generative terminologies, uh, gathering, sharing. Uh, generating, uh, you know, so, so it sort of changes the, the the protocol in which we engage making work like this. Uh, and, and right away, um, I was met with this idea of, uh, well, we, we, we work together, we, 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 we share, we share, we share our approaches to, to generating uh, media and to using technology. And so right away, it was, it was collaborative. 
um, for, for, for in, in the way that I kind of approached art. It, it took me a long time to learn how to be an artist, I think. Um, uh, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I, I worked as a sort of filmmaker for a long time and I, I really didn't consider myself to be an artist. And it really wasn't until probably three years ago or so when I started the, the MFA program at UNM that I was finally like, okay, I have to be an artist now. And that's kind of when I learned how to have an individual practice. I had never really made things before. And now, now I'm like, okay, after all these years of really centering concepts of protocol uh, and collaboration and sharing and, uh, you know, working to sort of recenter indigenous concepts of place and technology, uh, et cetera. It's like, okay, I think I know how to have an individual practice as an artist. Um, and now I'm fresh out of grad school and confused and trying to relearn again how to be an artist. But <laughs> um, again, I think it, it comes back to these concepts of, of, of pro protocol. It's just like so forward, so centered to, um, I don't know, at least as a starting point. I, I, I could talk, probably say a lot more about all that, but I want to hand it over to Jen then comment also. Um, so I feel similarly to Dylan. Um, I think it took me a long time to really feel like an artist. Um, and it wasn't really until I started collaborating with people and kind of deconstructing what does it mean to be an artist and what does it mean to be a photographer and new media artist. I kind of also wanted to break bounds in that way. Um, and I like to break bounds with technology. Um, I like to push it beyond its limits. Um, so I think um, overall my perception of place and, and the world that we interact in kind of has caused me to almost want to rebel against it. I feel like in the art world, there is a very typical artist that has a studio that creates work within a certain area. And now that's kind of evolving and there's a, a lot more artists of color and more collaboration. And I think I, I've just sort of, um, I just thrive on that, being able to collaborate with people, being able to engage with the community and being able to have like sort of a collective understanding that we all play a part in the world and in art. Um, so that's kind of how I've found my way in my work and, and, and yeah. Was pretty short, but yeah. <laughs> um, That's great. You know, I, 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 um, I'm thinking about the generational business, not just because I taught art and research uh, for a very long time uh, and have practiced it, but also because uh, inevitably for me, the kind of work that you're bringing uh, to us today really causes me to reflect on um, how powerfully it moves us into new terrain than you know, certain earlier approaches to this. So for example, Dylan, while I'm looking at your work, you know, I'm thinking of course of Patrick Nagatani's you know, amazing photographs of uranium tailings at Laguna Pueblo. And those photographs were made maybe around 1990. Right. I mean, they were some of that was recently featured in the um, uh, the uh, unsettled landscape show at uh, site Santa Fe and um, and Jen, when you know, I was listening to you and, um, you know, about uh, curation and and randomization and control and slippage and all of those things, I was thinking of things like you know, what would it have been like if, if the filmmaker Vim Vendors had access to certain kinds of programming languages when he made his film, The End of Violence, uh, you know, which is, you know, like a major media statement about uh, the relationship between violence and surveillance and the ubiquity of, of, of uh, image making technologies and the way in which uh, they raise questions about their inherent violence and the multiple legacies of violence which they perpetuate and escalate and amplify as a, you know, technologies of an amplification of violence. 
And so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to these earlier iterations of ways people, you know, have thought about um, how to, you know, give us a visual image. And then I thought, you know, like, what would it look like if Patrick Nagatani's photographs were taken with drones? Or what would it look like if Vim Vendor's The End of Violence was made, you know, like from something like an archive of video, the kind that Jennifer is, you know, uh, put together and then, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, remixed or created a, a possibility for a constant remix through the use of, you know, MIDI and randomizing and other kinds of, of technologies. So I, I see your work as, you know, you know, part of a larger, a larger story and on a larger continuum, but I'm really so happy to see the new ways, the new directions you, you've taken it. And I wonder, um, you know, if you feel that, um, if, if both of you feel that your work is in conversation with uh, some of these other lineages, or if you're, you know, as part of the decolonization practices or the new methodologies related to, you know, feminist um, practices or decolonizing methodologies, you, you see this as, as more of a break with some of these past interests or more of a, you know, a kind of conversation or trying to restore, um, you know, this conversation. I guess I've never really thought of that. <laughs> um, I guess I'm not really trying to Maybe I am trying to break things. I don't know. Um, I think that I, I think our we're always evolving as people and as artists. And I think I like to take from what people have done previously and kind of incorporate it into the things I do now. Um, I'm always learning from the past, and um, we're really always influenced by our past. But I think it is important to move beyond it and create new narratives and create work that is kind of fitting to the times now um, and kind of progresses us forward. I think artists are really big proponents of progressing things. Um, and I don't know what it would have been like if, if they had different technologies in the past because I find myself using old technologies sometimes. Um, and incorporating it with new technology and blending them. Um, so, who knows? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. I feel like maybe there's, um, let me see. Uh, it just makes my mind kind of go to a lot of different places. Um, I, I think a lot of the work, I think a lot of the approaches that I have to making work have been have been have been for the most part based in concepts of of referencing history or historical uh referencing historical approaches to to making um early early on um one of the reasons i started that art collective with with um primarily with chinupa hans galuga was that we went to we were in college together um, we started at IAI at the same time and we finished the, the same class. And so we spent a lot of time in conversation with each other. And he was probably the first artist that I really, um, I don't know, it was just very monumental to me. And we spent a lot of time sharing like creation stories with each other. We would sit around and he'd tell me Lakota creation stories, Hidatsa uh, creation stories. And I'd, I'd tell him Navajo, Diné uh, creation stories. And we would find incredible overlap and diversity uh, in, in our stories. And I think through that, some really simple concepts emerged for me. Uh, one of them being um, this concept of, of making things beautiful. Um, and I think that in, if you look at that in a conventional, you know, art, art school sort of language, it, 
does nothing but to to approach that through sort of again this like indigenous lens this concept of making your world beautiful is there's a lot of room there to to play in and to grow in uh it, it, in this idea of like one of my favorite things that we would Snoop and I would talk about was this idea that like um historically you would you could see like um in old regalia uh, photographs from like the plains, uh, Hidatsa, Lakota. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, folks wearing like a like a tin bean can, uh, you know, on their arms, and it's like decorated and or, or beaded, or it's got porcupine quills on it, or some like leather work or something on it. But it's like it's a tin can, and and I just love this idea of like you just make what you can with the technology you have and people have always been that way people have always celebrated the technology that they have sort of whether it's i don't know without with without any sort of disclaimers you're just kind of like well i don't even you make do with what what you have and i don't mean that necessarily in like you just get by i mean i mean that in like you invent and you reinvent and you repurpose and you multipurpose. And, and I think that I see that in, in Jennifer's work. I see, I, I see this idea of like, I, I don't, I'm super not trying to put words in your mouth Jen, but just as an example, I'm like, well, I don't know. You, we, we, we work with what we have access to. We play with the tools that we have access to it's, it's a constant reference to what has been done before us. I think the more, I think artists have a lot of different approaches to a lot of approaches and a lot of different answers to your question, Steve. But for me, it's like, well, I can't really see myself as doing anything that, that, that is that separate from what people have, have done. Um, and I, and I like that. I like this idea that, uh, I personally am not really trying to do anything new or inventive. Uh, like I'm just trying to, um, I'm trying to embrace the fact that we've always been, uh, I don't know, very multifaceted technological tinkers, you know, and storytellers. And um, I don't know. I like that idea. There's a lot to be said there though. I, I feel like, um, I don't know. I like, I like really, I could really unpack that question mm -hmm. um for a long time but i don't know that's the starting point at least well let's all get together and talk for a weekend uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's really a lot of fun and i think something that's really wonderful about the work that both of you are doing is that it connects so much with um many different you know other kinds of generations and approaches in ways people have tried to pose some of these questions. And then uh, it also connects to, you know, breaking and moving on. And um, uh, I wanna move to the Q&A and thank you for the prompt, Amy, to, to do that. Um, and uh, there's, um, I mean, Q&A beyond my Q&A uh, uh, opportunity here uh, for which I thank both of you. Uh, there, there are people who've put some questions in the Q and A box. Amy, do you want to curate that or um, uh, come in and uh, moderate that? Sure, I can. I can read them out. Uh, we have mm -hmm. one question for Dylan. Uh, uh, someone would love to hear Dylan speak more about how he created the visual scores. How are the images generated, and how do musicians? follow a score? Is it a very prescribed, is it very prescribed or more interpretive? Yeah. So um, let's see the, I, I've been working with this concept of scores for, for, uh, for a few years now. It's kind of, uh, I don't know, taking little unexpected turns along the way, ju just as we've kind of just been talking about the use of technology. Um, so too is scoring, I think, a, a technology. Um, my, just a little brief context, I, after I finished undergrad, I, I started working uh, pretty closely with a, a group of um, musicians 
uh, based out of sort of the New York City area that are dedicated, committed to playing the music of um, composer Anthony Braxton. Uh, and again, this is a probably another another separate story, but um, I started. I I became really immersed in this community that was that was playing. Uh, you know, some of the words to describe it are, you know, experimental new music, uh, jazz improvisational music, um, using graphic notation. Anthony Braxton is a composer that has used many forms of, uh, I don't know, quote unquote, experimental music notation um, over the years. And it was my first real kind of deep dive into one, working with musicians, uh, but two, these concepts of like, uh, systems for improvisation um, and like com complex systems uh, and, and complex knowing of systems for improvisation. Like all of that just like blew my mind as I was working with all these musicians for a few years. Um, and honestly, it kind of made me step away from music for a while or, or even sound because I was like, oh man, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm a musician. Like I, I, I'm, I like these folks are musicians. Like, ah, I'm not that. <laughs> and, and it wasn't until recently, I think, that I started to step back into music performance, like feel okay about it. But for a while, it's really like, ah, that's really intimidating when you're, when you're surrounding yourself with like studying musicians. Um, anyway, my approaches to, to, to scoring have been um, kind of simply uh, th this idea of, of its translation. It's it's been, um, for example, the, the piece, There Must Be Other Names for the River, again, another collaborative piece. Um, that piece was taken or created by, um, uh, like I mentioned in my, briefly in my talk um, or the intro, uh, historic streamflow data from the Rio Grande. So it's uh, along the, the, the Rio uh, from the headwaters in Colorado all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, where the border is in a sense, weaponized and used as a border. Um, that whole length, there are like thousands of uh, of stream flow monitoring stations that measure how much water is moving along any point at any given time. And it's all real-time data you could access on USGS website uh, right now. You can you can watch in real time all this data. It's it's like open source available to the public data. Uh, and what we did was we took these databases of all these, the data sets of all of all of this data from that was collected along the Rio as far back as we could find. Uh, some of the oldest stations went back to like the 1890s or something. Um, but then we just straight up took that data in a spreadsheet and visualized it. It's like now we have lines and we have circles. And so for that piece, it was us trying to get as close as possible to portraying the the actual data set but then it moves into this abstract space of now we're working with that visualized data with a singer uh, or with a choir and so how then do we workshop that so it's like well now it now it's like now we're in a room together and we're talking about uh what are different concepts of embodying this this data what does it mean to to sing this lifespan of the river and so part of it is kind of talking conceptually. What, is, what does that mean? What does that feel like? What does that sound like? What does it sound like coming out of your body, singing it, singing a river? Um, and so it's a lot, of, a lot of workshopping when I'm working with these experimental scores. Um, and so they're not, they're, they, they tend not to be prescribed. I think because I don't have that sort of conventional um, uh, systems thinking of how a score would work. Um, instead, my approach is like, I don't, re I'm just going to call it a score. And, and I, even if it's not technically a score, I'll, I'll call it a score, workshop it with you, music, you, music, a musician, translate it into a music performance, and then like, see what happens. And that's been my process is just kind of been like, I, I'll just call things a score and, and we translate it musically and see what happens. That image I showed of the tail uranium tailing site, I call that a score. And the idea is that we will follow the line, the, the information that's visually presented in that image um, to create songs. 
Um, but it's a, it's a process of, of kind of deeply workshopping, intellectual workshopping, emotionally workshopping what, what those scores mean. Um, so I think it, I think it just de depends on who, who I'm working with, but mostly that's kind of my approach is like, it's gonna take some time to really understand what we're working with. And I, I don't think the scores that I make can really stand alone. Um, I was kind of joking before we started this Zoom call or maybe, I don't know, in a practice Zoom call or something that I'm a, a sound artist that doesn't make any sounds actually. <laughs> and, and I think that's only half not true. Like I, I think what I'm mostly interested in is not necessarily the, the like the sonic outcome, but, but rather like the process of how do we get there? Um, and I, I don't mean to romanticize that, like, necessarily i don't really romanticize the process at all it's just kind of like it's all research right it's all like i don't know let's just see let's just see what happens if we can like maybe one of the results is like i might have someone come up to me and say um what well, you know i listened to that music performance piece and uh and, and what you did was you found ways for me to emotionally attach uh or sentimentally attach or ex experientially attach myself to a data set that otherwise I would have no emotional connection to, uh, you know, it, it like, it makes me, it gives someone maybe the opportunity to, to experience through sound, through music, which tends to be sometimes very an emotional, an emotional experience, um, gives people the ability to connect in this particular piece, connect to, the threatened nature of the Rio Grande, which is a lifeline in New Mexico and the whole south of this whole region, absolute lifeline. It, it gives people the ability to feel it, see, hear it, sense it in a way that maybe they, they just don't really get to otherwise. Um, and that can be a really he heavily emotional experience. Uh, and some people might say that's really important for us to do right now, especially as the Rio Grande right now is in like absolutely incredible crisis. Absolutely. Um, and if you don't know about that, spend some time reading about it. I mean, there's a lot of crises that we're living amongst right now, these weeks, these days around the world. But um, if you're living in New Mexico, that's, you know, that's our lifeline. Anyway, that was a long-winded question or answer to that question, but that's a bit of how I approach um, that the idea of scoring. Dylan, can you add the website for that yeah. piece? Thank you. I was going to say, uh, just to reiterate um, how much material is already is on the web and uh, encourage people to go to it. If, if both Dylan and Jen could put in the chat, uh, URLs um, at the end of the um, session today. Uh, that would be great, and uh, I hope people can can follow up. There's a question for uh, for uh, Jen here, also um, uh, like the previous one from from Andrea Polly uh, and uh, Jen. Uh, Andrea is asking, one of the first works that you presented is so evocative in this time of COVID. Um, you, I believe you called the interactive images interruptions or invasions into personal space. Um, you know, and she asks, uh, does that work uh, take on new meaning for you now that we've had this collective experience of COVID and do you plan to do more with, uh, with those kinds of images? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Um, I um, called them intrusions. Um, and I guess it does kind of take on a new meaning. Um, for me, um, at that point in my life, the intrusions uh, were very dark and, and probably not in a great mindset. And I kind of wanted to explore how to um overcome some of that and I, I kind of went to art to do that 
Um, and now we've all kind of gone through this really traumatic experience. And I think we all have this collective understanding of, of, of the world basically not, um, basically not caring what we want or what we, we think is best. Um, so I do think that I, I want to make more of this type of work and kind of speak to things that we cannot control and try to give some more understanding to that. Um, I have been making more work about land and place, um, but it's kind of evolved because I can't make interactive work in the same vein that I did before um, because now there's so many COVID protocols like um, and we all kind of have this understanding that we can't really be around each other and we can't really um, do the things that we used to. So I think um, my work is kind of evolving into this new world. Like how do we engage with each other? How do we make work together now um, in, in a safe manner? Um, and I think we've kind of seen the world res respond to us. Um, I mean, we haven't really treated it very nicely. <laughs> um, we've kind of just taken and taken. So um, I guess the work that I'm doing now is more on that type of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's definitely changed the meaning of that piece there. Um, I think we're resilient people and we're gonna overcome this hopefully. Um, <laughs> But I do think that it does create um, kind of, uh, we all have like this, the same kind of thoughts now, like, did I forget my mask? Did I touch a surface that was um, potentially infected or something? So um, I think that definitely does inform my work now and how I move forward. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. I can continue on yeah I'm very sure that's great um I know some people have commitments but it's great that we've been able to go on um and extend this uh program uh till almost seven o'clock and um uh, Amy if you don't have other things that you want to end with I would like to end with one little thing um which is um, since the theme of this event today is the uh, ecology of sound, um, for those who, who, who didn't notice it on um, August the 14th, just a few days ago, uh, the world lost uh, Murray Schaefer. And Murray Schaefer was a visual artist and a composer and the person who popularized the idea of acoustic ecology or ecologies of sound um, in his work, uh, particularly a book called The Tuning of the World and many compositions. Uh, he was suffering in recent years and both um, humorously, ironically, and um, engaging with his own world of uh, increasing sonic and visual confusion. Uh, titled his last major composition, um, Alzheimer Majestic. And um, the last correspondences uh, many of us had with him, uh, Murray answered by just sending postcards full of doodles. And um, uh, uh, in any case, um, he uh, brought this idea of uh, acoustic ecology uh, into the mainstream in the late 70s and early 80s uh, with his research uh, companions. And um, uh, both through his music compositions and his radio programs and uh, many other kinds of um, interventions. So uh, for those who are interested in uh, the legacy of this idea of ecologies of sound or acoustic ecologies, um, you might um, explore some of the work of, uh, of uh, Mary Schaefer, R. Mary uh, Schaefer, who, uh, by the way, uh, was a prodigy visual artist, um, but who lost an eye at the age of eight and who uh, was not allowed entrance into art school 
because his teacher said you can never be a visual artist with one eye. And so he became a composer. But the way he used his visual art skills was he went exactly into the territory that Dylan was talking about. He created multiple new languages for graphic notation and multiple forms of um, graphicalizing uh, sounds of environments and interactions of sounds of environments, um, and notation systems for sounds of environments and their interactions with different kinds of uh, human uh, musical uh, sources and uh, published many of, uh, many of those kinds of notations as well as a book about uh, sonic graphicalization. Um, so, a uh, sad note for, for us, but also uh, somebody whose life is, uh, uh, leaves a, a lot to celebrate, particularly for people who are interested in ecologies of sound. Um, there was another question. I answered it. Um, I typed it. They asked me how um, we projection map the agave and what steps were taken, and I answered it. Um, Basically, we use Mad Mapper um, to map it, and there was a lot of software and hardware that was used to create the whole thing. And Jen, you're mapping it onto a form, a physical form, correct? Yes. So we fabricated it. Um, we actually made it at Fuse Makerspace. Um, that's a uh, kind of a great space we have in Albuquerque that uh, has laser cutters and a wood shop and a bunch of equipment that you can use. Um, and we were able to laser cut all the leaves and basically test it all out there. Well, thank you. Steve, do you have any other lines of inquiry you wanna pursue? No, but um, I'm, I hope people follow up uh, with uh, Jen's work and Dylan's work through their websites. And uh, it's really been interesting. And um, I feel like uh, even though we, we barely know each other, I could be talking to the two of you for days and days and, <laughs> and sharing lots of images and sounds. It's really been a great pleasure. Thank you both. Yeah, thanks to all of you. This was fascinating and I've really appreciated being able to see your work and hear you talk about it at greater length. So thank you very much. Jen and Dylan, what's next for you guys as far as pieces go? What are you working on currently? Jen, I know you said you had a piece in the works. Um, basically, I've been recording different landscapes and throwing them into Max and um, making code that makes them blend together. And I'm also exploring a version where people can interact with it. Um, and I've also been revisiting my old pieces. Um, I haven't photographed in a really long time, um, but it's mostly video and programming stuff now. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. So Dylan, are you done with the other names project to the extent that it's up and rolling and are you still working on it? Or are you working on something new? I think that it's, I've realized that a lot of my projects are like, just like years long projects. Um, there must be other names for the river started a couple of years ago and or two and a half years ago or something was the first performance and it just keeps you know it keeps it keeps surfacing and it, it keeps kind of asking to be remade and revisited and revisioned and the the link that i'm posting in the chat right now which hopefully is working for folks uh, i just checked and it works for me um is a web-based version of this music performance uh, hosted by the University of New Mexico's uh, Art Museum. So you can find out more about the piece there. Um, for now, we'll we'll see. I don't. I I honestly don't have much on my plate as of immediately right now. But I was kind of as designed. Um, it was. Uh, I don't know. It's been a big year for uh, for everybody and. 
I, I'm currently in a bit of kind of an artist's residency, artist retreat right now at the Salmon Creek Farm in Northern California, um, where I'll be for a while, just kind of, uh, I don't know, getting some perspective, uh, trying to rest, trying to work, um, getting re-inspired. Uh, I'm excited about what comes next, curious also about what comes next. Um, but yeah, that project, I think will, for now, for now, it's everything about it, you can find out on that website, uh, including everyone that's been involved, et cetera. Um, but no current, actually, I think we'll have some performances. We'll, we'll check, check that website and stay tuned. I think we'll, and like follow here, I'll put my, if, if those of you, I'll put, this is my Instagram handle. If you want to follow me on Instagram, I feel like that's the best place to keep in, to keep really informed of what I, of what I'm currently working on. If, if, if you're interested in that sort of thing, um, that's the space that I use most for updating folks. Um, anyway, yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks Jen for sharing the platform. Um, it's been yeah. really well, lovely to get to know your work and what an honor to be able to speak next to you. And Steve, thanks. Likewise, thanks for, um, her, you know, for being the moderator and for holding us together. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you to Andrew Poli and Syrat Santa Fe and to the New Mexico Humanities Council and to all of you 